The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalo Valyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to our distance education lesson for today. I am Pamboye Frederick, your human biology teacher. Before we dive into the focus of this lesson, I would like us to look at the assignment we had in the previous lesson. We had a task which required that we should do some findings and then respond in this perspective. What do you think happens to the products of cassava digestion in our bodies? Assuming that you ate cassava, maybe boiled cassava, raw cassava, cooked, or whatever. If you eat this cassava, so what do you think happens to the products of this digestion in our bodies? Do you send them out as feces, or what do you do? You see that if you had done these findings, you would have come up with a lot of responses. Some of these plausible ones could be as follows. Cassava actually contains starch. And we understand that when starch is digested, it is converted to glucose, which is first converted into maltose and then to glucose. And also, the end product will actually be fructose and galactose, which are monosaccharides. And this takes place in the alimentary, in the ileum, specifically in the ileum. This is where the digestion of starch ends. And in this situation, when it has been completed, they are absorbed into the intestine and they are carried by blood into the liver and other parts of the body. The glucose actually is used to provide what we call metabolic energy. That is the energy in which we are using to do work. I am able to talk because I am using energy, which we call adenosine triphosphate. So this energy is obtained from these sugars that we eat. And if there were excess of these uh, glucose molecules that have been absorbed, then they will be stored as glycogen in the liver and also in the muscles. Because the food you eat must not be used up at the same time. So you only use up the food that is during uh, respiration. It is broken down and you use the energy gradually. And you use the energy according to how your body needs it. So if your body does not need it at that same spot, then it will be stored. And then you can use it later. <laughs> With this and much more, I would like us to dive into the focus of this lesson. And in this lesson, we shall be talking about health education. In health education, there are several aspects, but we shall start in this lesson to look at some digestive disorders. Remember, we are looking at digestion, and this assignment we had was asking us to say what happens to the cassava we eat. When it is digested, what happens to it? If you eat a large quantity of cassava, is it going to make you stronger or make you healthy? Will you have a lot of energy or it rather makes you sick? But in this lesson, we shall have the opportunity to see what happens in our intestines at times when we eat in a kind of way. Therefore, we shall be looking at digestive disorders. This is very important because there are things that we experience almost on a daily basis, if you don't do it today, you may have it tomorrow, or your neighbor, your friend, or some other person might have a disorder. Therefore, for us to realize this, we shall follow this plan. We shall look at the objectives of this lesson, then some previous knowledge. We shall share a hypothetical real-life situation, and then we shall carry out a few activities in the course of this lesson. And of course, one or two exercises 
and it will enable us to end this lesson with an assignment. Because after watching, we are also supposed to do other things. Therefore, if you follow this lesson keenly, if you take down your notes and you actually understand what I'm explaining, then we expect that by the end of this lesson, you should be able to identify and distinguish digestive tract diseases and also bring out their symptoms. You should also be able to describe the causes, the effects, and how you can prevent at least four of these diseases from taking place along your intestine. You should also be able to state at least four types of remedies that you can apply at home or you can use at home if you discover that you have a digestive disorder. That said, you should start taking your notes. And for you to understand this lesson better or to understand it with ease, we assume that you have studied in the previous lessons and you have the ability to identify the main parts of the human digestive system. You can be able to draw the alimentary canal and name those parts and state their functions because we shall be referring to those parts when we are talking about the digestive disorders. And that said, I would like us to share this hypothetical real life situation. A few days ago, after supper, a girl suffered from heartburn belching and then vomiting and at the same time her stomach also ached throughout the night then she took some home remedies and the following morning she was rushed to the hospital then maybe you have experienced a situation like this but can you suspect what might have caused this kind of discomforting situation remember this girl Eight in the evening, that is supper is food that's eaten in the evening. And then she had all of these pains, discomfort, heartburn, and all of this. You as a human biology student, can you move a step further by suspecting what might have caused this discomfort? We shall look keenly at this as we go into the contents of this lesson. But from listening to this situation, we can observe that the food that is eaten during supper actually provoked a digestive disorder in this girl's body. And that's why she was having those pains and discomfort. Then, let us look at this picture below. Then, can we actually identify it or even bring out some parts? So if we look keenly at this picture and based on our previous lessons, we will understand that this is the picture of the alimentary tract. This is the mouth region up here. And then when food is taken, you will swallow it down into the esophagus, comes out to the stomach. This is the liver. And then you have the large intestines. This is here. This is the small intestine, what we call the ileum. So the food comes down from the mouth, the esophagus, to the stomach. Then it moves slowly and for a long time in this ileum and then it moves up and transversely and down right into the rectum along the large intestine and at this point it is actually the physis which is formed that you send out during defecation so this is the sample of the alimentary canal and it is in our bodies therefore when food is expected to pass from the mouth down to the anus what could be some digestive disorders that we can experience at one time or the other? We understand that health conditions that affect parts of the digestive tract because digestion takes place in the digestive tract. Therefore, if they have some abnormalities that make digestion not to go on as it is supposed to go, we will call that a digestive disorder because it will affect digestion negatively. And also, we have what we call digestive disorder diseases, which are signaled by symptoms, meaning that there are things that will happen. Either you feel them or you even see, which we call the symptoms, and even signs, if you see them, we call them signs. But if you feel, maybe you feel pain or belching, or that will be symptoms. And for example, if we have heartburn, feeling some pain at the upper part of the alimentary canal, or maybe we are vomiting, at least you will feel pain, but you also see the vomiting. So, vomiting actually is a sign because you can see it. But heartburn, you feel it. You will not see it. Therefore, it's a symptom. 
And therefore, you can have stomach ache. You feel the aching in the stomach. You feel it, but you cannot see it. So it's a symptom. Therefore, it is important for us to understand the difference between signs and symptoms. Because, for example, if we take gastritis, for example, you see that it can be asymptomized or can be symptomized by heartburn, by vomiting, by stomach ache, and usually pain in the epigastrium, this upper part of the alimentary canal. So those are some of the signs of uh, gastritis. But I would like us to look at signs and symptoms again in a more detailed perspective. Because as human biology students, you should be able to actually bring out this deep or detailed integrities of this material. A sign actually is an evidence of a disease that can be observed, meaning that you can see it with your naked eyes or you can even touch it with your hand. For example, you, have, you are vomiting. You can touch what you vomited with your hand and you see it coming out, although you also feel the pain. If you have a runny stomach, for example, maybe diarrhea, you're sending out liquid stool, you will feel the pain, but you also see the stool coming out. So we call these ones signs of a disease. And then for symptoms, these ones will refer to abnormalities that indicate that there is a potential health condition. Maybe you can feel the pain. In the stomach ache, you feel it, but you cannot see it. And then you have heartburn, you feel it, but you cannot see it. So you realize that a symptom is not seen, but a sign can be seen. Then, we also observe that all signs are symptoms, but not all symptoms are signs. All signs are symptoms, because symptom actually is a proof or evidence that there's an abnormality or that there's a disease in any part of the body. An appropriate diagnosis is very important to actually ascertain the health condition or the disease that is actually causing these symptoms. Therefore, if you feel pain or any of these in any part of your body, you may suspect disease A or disease B, but it is advisable to go to a clinic or a health unit where appropriate laboratory searches or findings will be done. And when they do these findings, what we call diagnosis, then they can be able to say that this heartburn, this vomiting, or this stomach ache is actually caused by disease A or disease B. And in such a situation, they will then give you the appropriate uh, treatment which will help to uh, relieve you of that um, abnormal condition. I would also like us to observe the digestive tract below and then we reflect deeply on where digestive disorders may occur. We had seen this earlier, but looking from the esophagus down here to the stomach, right, to the ileum and large intestines and the rectum here, or even the anus out here, where do we think some others can happen? But I would like us to reflect on our own selves because it may be abnormal for me to say that there is any of us who have never had one or two digestive disorders. So I would prefer that you reflect maybe for the past one week or the past two weeks and then think, have you had a situation where you were feeling some abnormality? Have you vomited? Have you seen your little one or bigger one vomit? What has happened? In such a situation, what might have been happening? Have you ever felt pain in the stomach? Maybe heartburn or whatever kind of thing. Then it is important for us that when we have such signs or such symptoms, we should try as human biology students to already preempt the particular part of the alimentary canal that may be affected negatively. Also, it is important for us, and with this reflection, to think about some digestive disorder diseases. What are some of them that have actually been uh, identified to exist? We have gastritis, which is quite common. But what do we say about gastritis? It is actually the inflammation of the stomach lining. When it is inflamed, or it's rather, it, 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 in, inflammation means in growing in, abnormally in size. Maybe like something uh, that is, uh, how do we explain? Uh, it, 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 it increases or it grows abnormally. Just maybe like when a mosquito bites you, you can have some slight inflammation there. So if such a situation happens inside the stomach, that is what we call gastritis. That is what happens. 
And in such a situation, you will see that inside the stomach, it will be causing pain in that particular area of the inflammation. And then outwardly, you will only feel the pain, but you cannot see it. You only feel the pain in the stomach. And in such a situation, this is what is happening inside. There's some inflammation there. And this inflammation can even give, give lead to wounds, what we call ulcers. And another disorder we have, we also have typhoid. And we have been hearing a lot about typhoid, which is a bacterial infection. And in this situation, the bacteria is called Salmonella typhi. And this disease is digestive because most often we get it from the food we eat or from the water we drink or from things that come into our mouth. Therefore, it is very, very important. And it is a common ailment. You see that when someone has typhoid, the person vomits, the person feels a lot of pain, and you see that he can have diarrhea, and he will be sick. So we see the person in bed. So typhoid fever actually is an ailment that actually causes us a lot of discomfort. And in this situation, you will not be able to carry out your work or studies effectively. Then we also have what we call gastrointestinal fungi or yeast cell. This is quite common in the young. In the young children about uh, or less than 10 years, it's quite common with them than with the elderly. But everybody can be affected by what we call yeast infections. And this actually results in an overgrowth of candida in the intestines, and it actually causes pain. Now you can see this person here indicating pain in the stomach. Therefore, we have even seen pain because of typhoid fever in the stomach. We have also seen it now because of yeast cell. Therefore, if you have this symptom of stomach ache, will you already conclude that it is yeast cell or it is typhoid? That is why you must go for a proper diagnosis. We also have what we call appendicitis. And this refers to actually the painful inflammation of the appendix. And when it inflames, you can see the appendix here, when it, there's an inflammation there, it's actually painful. And this, you cannot see it, but you feel a lot of pain here. And when you, are con when you go to the, uh, the right hospital or clinic, you will be operated upon. So they have to operate and then they will remove this inflammed this inflame tissue here. They will remove this appendix. So they always call it appendicitis. You can see someone here feeling pain because the person has uh, appendicitis. But you will not see, but you feel the pain. Therefore, any pain you feel is important that you go and consult. We also have what we call pi or hemorrhoid. And what actually it is, is it is the swelling or an inflammation of the veins around the rectum. And this actually causes pain and also bloody stool. So in this situation, you can see the rectum here. It becomes inflamed. So if we magnify this rectum, that's the part which is to the exterior of the anus. If we magnify it, you see it like this. This is the part here, which has been magnified up like this. So you can see how these sides are inflamed. You see it. And when it inflames like this, it can lacerate. There can be wounds on it. And when it is wounded, blood will come out to the feces. And when the person is defecating, he has difficulty to send out stool. And when feces is being forced to come out, there's the likelihood that it will cause wounds on this inflamed area. And when it is wounded, you now find blood coming out with the feces. And at times, this inflammation actually causes the walls of the rectum to elongate. And when it becomes so long, it actually bulges out. So in such a situation, you see this, this sign here, showing that the part of the rectum is actually coming out. So you can see it coming out. So pile can lead to this level. But the good thing is that once you suspect that you have it, you should consult the appropriate health unit for proper treatment. You can see someone here who has pile and he is defecating with a lot of difficulty. A lot of difficulty because of the pain in the end you can understand what it means. So if you have it, it is advisable to consult the right quarters. Let's look at gastritis. We have seen it before. What actually causes it? It is actually a bacterial infection and actually it can result from too much alcohol or a lot of consumption of spicy foods. And even when you are hungry for too long, 
or even smoking and stress. These are some of the causes of gastritis, but not all. But these are very common. And gastritis is quite common in our environments today, maybe because of these and much more. But how will you feel or suspect that you have gastritis? What are the symptoms? You have heartburn, you have belching, you have vomiting, you have stomach upset, you have loss of appetite. And remember, hunger can cause gastritis. And when you have it, it rather prevents you from eating. Therefore, in this situation, you realize that it will be a, what we call a, a, a positive feedback effect. Positive feedback in a way that you had gastritis, you were hungry, it led to gastritis, and then the gastritis causes you not to want to eat. Therefore, the hunger will continue, and then the gastritis will intensify. So you see, that is what we call a positive feedback effect. Therefore, if you have gastritis, and you are losing appetite, it is advisable that you forcefully eat. Because as you force yourself and eat, then there's the likelihood that you will get relieved of that gastritis. So we should take note of this. Then how do you prevent it? We see that you should avoid taking too much painkillers, maybe paracetamol, codeine, and all of those. Avoid it because it can cause it. And then you should reduce your stress level. Maybe you have a lot of issues that are disturbing, and then you stress up you are thinking and solutions are not coming, it is good to relax. Because when you have it, they can lead to gastritis. And you should also avoid hot and spicy foods. Don't go to the market and buy all the spices because you have the money. You will have your money, you will be, eat it, you enjoy it, but the feedback is that it can lead to gastritis, which will cause pain in your body. Also, I'd like us to look at gastrointestinal fungi, what we have called candida. This can come from too much consumption of can, uh, candida albicans and also histoplasmolysis in the intestines. This is from food, food that use yeast. We can have this. We know that yeast is candida albicans. So if you eat food that contain a lot of yeast, you are likely to have gastrointestinal fungi. Even palm wine. Because there's natural yeast. Yeast is not that you only buy the one in the shop. And you, there are foods that we consume that have yeast. Even palm wine is one of them, and many others. And what will you see or feel to suspect that you have uh, fungi? There will be diarrhea, vomiting, abnormal pain. There will be fever. You can have constipation. And how do you prevent this? You simply avoid consumption of high quantities of refined foods. Do, do not consume a lot of sugar foods. And then you should endeavor to do regular exercises and also take enough sleep. These are some of the things that when you do, you reduce the chances that you can have this yeast infection. Also, we look at appendicitis. How is it caused? What causes it? How does it come about? It results from a viral infection or it can be a bacterial infection or even a parasite that has gained access into the body. But one of the things that is closely associated, but not yet proven to be directly associated, is the consumption of dry foods. When you consume a lot of dry foods and drink less water, there's the tendency that some of it may accumulate at the appendix. And with time, it can lead to appendicitis. But what are some of the symptoms that you will have? You can have right lower abdominal pain, you can have nausea, Fever, you can be vomiting, maybe from time to time. There can also be blockage of linkage to the appendix. You realize that in this situation, if it is completely blocked, you will not see it, you will not feel it. But when an X-ray or any ultrasound is taken, this can be diagnosed. And in such a situation, treatment is needed in the appropriate health unit. But how do you prevent this from happening? It is important to eat food that contain fiber, Remember, when we talked about digestion, we talked of fiber. When we are looking at macro molecules or macronutrients, we talk of fiber because fiber will facilitate the movement of food along the alimentary canal. You also eat whole grains and you eat fruits because when you consume these, they will enable and ease digestion and you, you reduce the chances of you having this appendicitis. We also look at hemorrhoid or pie. This actually can be caused when you gain a lot of weight. Maybe you are eating a lot, resting, sleeping, and then you think that you want to be fat. Good and fine, but 
it may lead to hemorrhoids. It may lead to the inflammation of your, the rectum. And what will you have or feel or see before you can think that you have uh, hemorrhoids? You can have an itchy anus. Therefore, it means that you always be sending your finger to be scratching your anus. And you can understand how embarrassing it can be in the public. Then, you can also have heart pumps or heart burns. And then, also, when you want to defecate, your feces will come out in tiny lumps, in small bundles like that. And when you are sitting on the chair, you will feel pain in the anus. And you see the rectum blood may even come out on your pants, even when you are not defecated. And there will always be a lot of blood in your feces because of those wounds in the rectum. But how do you prevent this? This is important. It is good that as you eat, as you buy food or prepare your food to eat, eat food that contains plant tissues, like arrows, something like that, and many others. Then, you should not sit for too long. There are some persons who are sedentary. You sit for 10, 20 hours, and then you just walk for a while and you continue sitting. This may be due to your work, but it is advisable to also take exercises. Because sitting as such, you overstrain the rectal region. And then it is good to go to the toilet immediately you feel the urge defecates. And it's also good to drink a lot of water throughout the day. In fact, it is advisable that you drink water in the morning. Some persons can drink at, as much as half or a liter in the morning with an empty stomach before they start any other thing. Then what about typhoid? What actually causes it is a bacteria we call Salmonella typhi. And you can get it from maybe contaminated water or even food, and it's really fermented foods. And what will you have to know that you have or suspect that you have typhoid? You have seen that you can have high fever, weaknesses, vomiting, stomach pain, loss of appetite, and all the others. But how do you prevent it? You drink actually water that is treated. Even at home, you boil it and filter and let it cool before you drink. And also, you avoid eating raw foods. Because raw foods are inhygienic and they can actually contain this bacteria and much more. Also, if you have any of these uh, digestive disorders, or even some that we have not mentioned, because this list is not exhaustive, what can you do? How can you treat it? You realize that home remedy or maybe conventional treatment can go. Home remedy means what you know you can do on your own. Or you go to a clinic. And for home remedy, it is advice that you can prepare some medication, maybe tonic, or from, you get to someone who knows what to do. Like in our real life situation where uh, something was done, we come back to that. And then you can administer, even without prescription, what we call over-the-counter drugs. And this comes from experience. You go to people who have ideas, they will then tell you which you can take if you have whatever kind of discomfort. Then, it could be a combination of herbs or whatever that is boiled or maybe an infusion. And home remedies or conventional remedies actually will treat specific ailments. They are not broad spectrum. So you don't take anything and think that it will treat everything. Therefore, for conventional treatment, this will be therapy that is widely used and accepted by most health professionals. This will be gotten from a recognized clinic. But home remedy, you can take whatever thing, but it is not actually advisable if you are not sure. Therefore, usually, a conventional treatment is prescription from a health personnel. And what, therefore, could be the uses of some uh, home remedies? You see that widely used, these home remedies are widely used, and in many cases, they have been proven to be effective. Especially, each environment has their own specific leaves that they use. Please, watch out. Go to people who are experienced. Don't just eat anything. Then, each digestive disorder and the symptoms that we have specified have specific remedies. More experienced persons are always better. And then we have help of herbalists. We have seen them. They are people who have experience in those issues to use herbs. Therefore, what could be the use of conventional treatment? This is widely acclaimed and used for the treatment of symptoms of specific diseases. Therefore, each disease has its own medication, and usually it is prescribed after a diagnosis. Take note, in both cases, proper diagnosis is required before administration of medication, whether it is home remedy or it is conventional treatment. So with this, I would like us to have a review of this, our real-life situation, where we said that a few days ago, 
After supper, a girl suffered from heartburn, bulging, vomiting, and all the like. And then was wondering what should have happened. So from this, we can come out with some comments on this situation that the heartburn, bulging, and vomiting actually with the stomach ache are symptoms of a digestive disease disorder that we have seen. But diagnosis of this digestive disorder is important before you can specify. The home remedies which she took as maybe as first aid or so, you realize that they actually gave her some relief. But the following morning, she had to be rushed to the hospital for proper diagnosis and treatment. We had observed also that the food which she ate actually provoked a digestive disorder in the body. And from this and the contents of this lesson, we have seen that there is always need for proper diagnosis to ascertain the underlying cause for appropriate treatment. It might be the case of food poisoning and not the food itself. There might be something that caused someone to call food poisoning. Therefore, diagnosis is very important. With this, I would like us to do this brief exercise to fill just the blanks here. We have uh, this digestive disorder disease symptoms or effects. We have gastritis, what should be here? And we have an empty space here. Then here we have heart burn, a headache, a constipation, and all the like. So in filling it, what do we have? We realize that for gastritis, the symptoms are heart burn, vomiting, constipation, belching, stomach ache like we are seeing. And then for these symptoms of diarrhea and all of this, they refer to typhoid. So you will suspect typhoid, but you will still also have to go for proper diagnosis. Then, in this situation, you can only conclude that you have treated this or you have this after proper diagnosis. Remember, I insist, after proper diagnosis. And with this, dear learners, I would like us to take home this assignment. I would require you to do a research, consult materials, internet, and all the like, and then identify two other digestive disorder diseases that we have not mentioned in this lesson. Identify two others. And then for these two, you indicate their causes, the effects, and the method of prevention. Try to do this. And before our next lesson, you realize that it will be very interesting. You can consult these materials because we consulted them, although they are not exhaustive, in the production of this lesson. And with this, dear learners, we have come to the end of this lesson. In our next lesson, we shall look at hygiene of the mouth and teeth. See you in our next lesson. Una tege majang matege ndom mane tambia ninya ne njobya yen ngani bana matege mot ngani la kiri watege ndom esekina bia dinki do mane tambia ninya ne njobya yen tam tama mote tam zabike tam tama tonge tam zabike tam tam tama mote tam zabike mane tambia ninya ne njobya yen